What's up guys, Keith here. If you're in a point in life where you have to pick a major to be a foundation of what you do in life, something that's intellectually stimulating, gets you hands-on experience, or you work with a lot of interesting people across the globe, and has a starting salary in the six figures right out of college, petroleum engineering is the major for you. Did that sound like an infomercial? That's why universities are pitching kids to get them into petroleum engineering programs. That message was true in the early 2010s, when the price of oil was hovering over $100 per barrel. In 2020, that's an entirely different story. The oil and gas industry you might be graduating into with a petroleum engineering degree is a big pile of unpleasantness and I would we are very far away from. If you go to Reddit and do a simple search for petroleum engineering, you'll see a lot of posts about people who graduated with a petroleum engineering degree into a downturn in 2016 and 2020. They seem lost, regret their decision to go into petroleum engineering school, and are trying to change into a different industry. In this video, I want to step back and look at this decision from a big picture standpoint. Choosing a major is a big life decision. You'll be spending four to five years in school when you could have been working full time, paying them twenty dollars to $30,000 a year conservatively. The total opportunity cost with this decision is about $250,000 unless you have a scholarship. So if you're making this decision from a return on investment standpoint, it makes sense to pick something with a very high starting salary. And if you're someone with the talent and inclination towards engineering, petroleum engineering makes sense from a return on investment standpoint. But one thing that's left out of this discussion is risk assessment. Going forward, the oil and gas industry you'll be working in faces four major risks. There's OPEC fighting for market share. We have renewable energy and technological disruptions cutting into the supply side. There are 2050 carbon neutrality goals agreed upon by governments across the globe. And because of all this, there's a hesitancy by investment firms to back fossil fuel projects. Let's look into these in a little bit more detail. Starting with OPEC. If you don't know who OPEC is and you're about to go into engineering school, put a halt on everything and just read up on what OPEC cartel is. When you graduate from a petroleum engineering program here in the US, the odds are you won't be working for OPEC. You'll be working on land here in the US. There are two types of companies you could be working for. Companies with unconventional assets and conventional assets. The big boom in activity that came over the last decade was from unconventional assets. This has also been called the shale revolution. That's where most of the demand for petroleum engineers came from recently. Most assets here on US land are unconventional. On the other hand, for OPEC, it's mostly conventional. There are quite a few geological differences between conventional and unconventional assets, but the big difference is for an unconventional oil and gas well, you have to frack them before you can produce oil and gas. This means after the oil and gas well is drilled, before oil flows, they have to break the formation with various tools and high pressure. In a conventional well, you don't need to do that for oil and gas to be produced. Drilling a well on land costs about $2 million. Now on top of that, for unconventional assets, you have to spend $2 million to frack the well. So the total cost is about $4 million. A well in an OPEC nation doesn't have to be fracked. So their only cost is drilling it. So that just comes out to $2 million. We're ignoring some production and maintenance costs here, but for all intents and purposes, it only costs OPEC half the amount to bring their wells online. So whenever the OPEC committee feels like the US or any other nation with unconventional assets are eating into their market share, they just manipulate the market to gain it back. A lot of US companies with their debt burden can't survive an environment where prices are below $40 a barrel for long. And then comes the layoffs to cut costs and mergers and acquisitions and more layoffs and bankruptcies and more layoffs. You get the idea. This happened in 2014 when OPEC initiated a price war against US shell companies. And it's going on right now in 2020 as a result of the price war they started against Russia and also the pandemic. 
The second reason is renewable energy and technological innovations cutting into the supply side. Just like OPEC has an advantage when it comes to costs against U.S. shale, the cost for renewable energy has been declining as well. In 2019, EIA said that half of the new installations for solar and wind undercut fossil fuels on costs when it comes to power generation. Electric cars have come a long way towards the end of the last decade with Tesla leading the way. It's kind of hard to tell if electric cars are going to remain a niche market or if it's going to disrupt the auto industry just like the iPhone did with cell phones. With the grid we currently have, and because wind and solar kind of have their own schedule, we don't have the technology to distribute power or store it effectively as of now. But regardless, it's still a risk. The timeline for solutions to the renewable problem to get here seems like it's going to be sooner rather than later. If you're graduating in 2020 with a petroleum engineering degree, and you hope to have a working career that's 30 years taking you all the way to 2050. The risk of serious technological disruption in the oil and gas industry is pretty high. And that time frame of a 30 year working career brings us to the next risk, which is the 2050 carbon neutrality agreements. As I'm making this video, it's looking like Joe Biden might be winning the election in 2020. And his campaign has promised an accelerated path to carbon neutrality. California has set a goal to not sell any ICE cars after 2035. UK has talks on doing the same by 2030. In Europe, for all intents and purposes, they're producing more power from renewable resources than from fossil fuels. And a lot of this is coming from tax breaks and subsidies for renewable energy. These are causing even companies like Shell and BP which are based in the UK, to aim for those carbon neutrality goals by 2050. China, one of the biggest oil and gas consumers, they're aiming for their own version of energy independence by increasing renewables. It looks like renewable companies are being subsidized more and more, and there's going to be some form of carbon taxes in fossil fuel companies. That means more renewables and less oil and gas over time. And that brings us to reason number four, investor capital. Investors consider all these risks and, whether true or not, start to buy into the narrative that oil and gas is not sustainable. So there's less and less investor capital going into oil and gas. Private equity firms are not funding shale companies anymore because they're not seeing cash flow unless you keep on drilling. Bigger firms like BlackRock have committed to not invest in oil and gas anymore because they don't think it's sustainable. Even the S&P 500 index fund that has attracted a lot of individual investor money only has less than 3% in oil and gas stocks. So not a whole lot of that indexer money is going into buying oil and gas stocks. This means lesser valuations for oil and gas companies. This is a disadvantage because a lot of companies fund their projects or mergers and acquisitions with stocks. The lesser the stock valuation, the lesser room you have for growth. In essence, oil and gas companies, at least on valuations, are getting smaller and smaller. So whenever you're considering being a petroleum engineer, this is a decision that could pigeonhole you into this industry. And why you would commit to an industry that's so volatile and so uncertain, that just doesn't make sense. And let's say you really want to get into oil and gas. You live in a part of the country where oil and gas is a major industry or you just think drilling rigs are cool, I don't blame you. You can still get into the industry when times are good with a mechanical or chemical engineering degree. And a lot of bigger companies have their own petroleum engineering program or a graduate program they put you through, which is a lot more up to date with where the industry is at today. I have a petroleum engineering degree. I worked in the industry for a while. It was fun, it was intellectually stimulating, I work with some great people, everything's true, but it all came to a halt in 2020 when I was laid off. A lot of us were. The industry's not in a great spot top to bottom, and a lot of us are trying to transition out to any other industry. And it's difficult, especially with a specialized, specific degree like petroleum engineering. If you had a generalist degree like chemical engineering or mechanical engineering, there's still a lot of jobs out there that would hire you. In this modern economy, 
The pace of change is getting faster and faster, whether it's technologically or politically or socially. So if you're picking a major, you want it to be adaptable. And within engineering, mechanical and chemical make sense for that. A specialized degree like petroleum engineering, it just doesn't make sense. Thank you for watching guys. Until next time, peace.